C. G. Jung, the eminent European psychoanalyst, writes in Wilhelm's Secret of the Golden Flower. Therefore, I can only take the reaction which begins in the West against the intellect. In favor of intuition, as a mark of cultural advance, a widening of consciousness beyond the too narrow limits set by a tyrannical intellect. Page 82. Incidentally, one of the greatest difficulties experienced by the philosopher, a difficulty almost insurmountable by the student, one which continually tends to increase rather than diminish with the advance in knowledge, is this. It is practically impossible to gain any clear intellectual comprehension of the meaning of philosophical terms employed. Every thinker has his own private conception of and meaning for even such common and universally used terms as soul and mind. And in the vast majority of cases he does not so much as suspect that other writers may employ the same term under a different connotation. Even technical writers, those who sometimes take the trouble of defining their terms before using them, are too often at variance with each other. The diversity is very great, as stated above, in the case of the word soul. We find one writer predicating of the soul that it is a B and C, while his fellow students protest vehemently that it is nothing of the sort but D, E and F. However, let us suppose for a moment that by some miracle we obtain a clear idea of the meaning of the word. The trouble has merely begun. For the immediate there immediately arises the question of the relation of one term to the others. In view of this continual source of misunderstanding, it is clearly necessary to establish a fundamental and universal language for the com communication of ideas. One understands with bitter approval the sad outburst of the aged Fichte, if I had my life to live over again, the first thing I would do would be to invent an entirely new system of symbols whereby to convey my ideas. Johann Gottlieb Fichte 1762 to 1814 was a German philosopher and one of the great transcendental idealists who was influenced by the philosophy of Kant. Attracted by the trend of Romanticism, he eventually came to believe that religious faith surpassed moral reason. Fichte's notion of the moral order of the cosmos and the moral character of societies was an important influence on Hegel. As a matter of fact, had he but known this, certain people, principally some of the early Kabbalists, among whom we may include Raymond Lully, William Postel, etc., William Postel, also known as Guglielmus Postelus, Guillaume Postel, 
to 1557, was a French Christian mystic and the first translator of the Sefer Yetzira into Latin, 1552. He also translated the Zohar. Had actually attempted this great work of constructing a coherent system. Those which were coherent were, sad to say, hardly comprehended or subscribed to. It is sometimes claimed that the Buddhist terminology as contained in the Abhidhamma. The Abhidhamma Pitaka is part of the Buddhist canon Tipitaka, the three baskets. The canonical and philosophical doctrines of early Buddhism, which was compiled during the third century BCE at the Council of Pataliputra. It is sometimes claimed that the Buddhist terminology, as contained in the Abhidhamma, provides a sufficiently complete philosophical alphabet. While there is much to be said in favor of the Buddhist system, we cannot wholly concur with this opinion for the following reasons. Firstly, the actual words are barbarously long, impossibly so for the average European. Secondly, an understanding of that system demands complete acquiescence in the Buddhist doctrinalia, which we are not prepared to give. Thirdly, the meaning of the terms is not as clear, precise and comprehensive as could be wished. There is most certainly a great deal of pedantry, disputed matter and confusion. Only recently I learned that Mrs. Rice Davids has issued a book, a book on Buddhist origins in which the question among others is raised by her as to the correct translation or meaning of the Pali word Dhamma, whether it implies law, conscience, life or simply the Buddhist doctrine. Fourthly, the terminology is exclusively psychological and takes no account of extra-Buddhistic ideas. And it bears but little relation to the general order of the universe. It might, of course, be supplemented by Hindu or other terminology. But to do so would immediately introduce more numerous elements of controversy. We should at once be lost in endless discussion as to whether Nibbana was Nirvana. Nirvana is based on the Sanskrit word Nirva, which means to blow out. In Buddhism it refers to liberation, emancipation from ignorance and the extinction of all attachment, an ineffable state in which one has attained disinterested wisdom and compassion. As to whether Nibbana was Nirvana and as to whether extinction or something else was implied and so on forever. The system of the Kabbalah whose terms as we shall see are largely symbolic is of course superficially open to this last objection. But because it is very largely symbolic, it has the best sanction of those who are considered eminent authorities in the sciences, for the whole of modern science occupies itself with various symbols by which it endeavors to comprehend the physical world. Symbols beyond which, however, it frankly confesses itself unable to pass. An illuminating remark occurs in Professor Eddington's 1928 Swarthmore Lecture, Science and the Unseen World. 
I can only say that physical science has turned its back on all such models, regarding them now rather as a hindrance to the apprehension of the truth behind phenomena. And if today you ask a physicist what he has finally made out the ether or the electron to be, the answer will not be a description in terms of billiard balls or flywheels or anything concrete. He will point instead to a number of symbols and a set of mathematical equations which they satisfy. What do the symbols stand for? The mysterious reply is given that physics is indifferent to that. It has no nirvana means of probing beneath the symbolism. To understand the phenomena of the physical world, it is necessary to know the equations which the symbols obey, but not the nature of that which is being symbolized. Sir James Jeans confirms this view of the use of symbols. Sir James Hopwood Jeans, 1877 to 1946, British astronomer, physicist and mathematician, was the first to suggest that matter is continuously created throughout the universe. He was famous for his work on the kinetic theory of gases and his research into the relationships between mathematical concepts and the natural world. He was best known as the author of numerous books on astronomy. His works include The Universe Around Us, 1929, Through Space and Time, 1934, The Dynamical Theory of Gases, 1904, Theoretical Mechanics, 1906, and The Mathematical Theory of Electricity and Magnetism, 1904. Sir James Jeans confirms this, this view of the use of symbols, for on page 141 on, of his The Mysterious Universe, he writes, The making of models or pictures to explain mathematical formula and the phenomena they describe is not a step towards, but a step away from, reality. In brief, a mathematical formula can never tell us what a thing is, but only how it behaves. It can only specify an object through its properties. The Kabbalist, therefore, is in no fear of attack from hostile sources because of his use of symbols. For the real basis of the Holy Kabbalah, the Ten Sephiroth, and the Twenty-Two Paths, is mathematically sound and definite. We can easily discard the theological and dogmatic interpretations of the ancient Rabbanim as useless and not affecting this real basis itself, and refer everything in the universe to the fundamental system of pure number. its symbols will be intelligible to all rational minds in an identical sense. Since the relations obtaining between these symbols are fixed by nature. It is the consideration which has led to the adoption of the Kabbalistic tree of life as the basis of the universal philosophical alphabet. The apologia for this system, if, if such be needed, is, as has already been stated, that our purest conceptions are symbolized in mathematics. Bertrand Russell Bertrand Arthur William Russell, 1872-1970 was an English philosopher and logician. 
He believed that the scientific view of the world was, for the most part, the right one. And his basic objective was to reduce the presumptions of human knowledge down to their simplest and most fundamental expression. His works include Human Knowledge, Its Scope and Limits, 1948, The ABC of Atoms, 1923, What I Believe, 1925, The Scientific Outlook, 1931, and An Inquiry into Meaning and Truth, 1940. In 1950, he received the Nobel Prize for Literature. Cantor Georg Cantor 1845-1918 was a German mathematician who developed the set theory of mathematics and introduced the useful concept of transfinite numbers numbers that are inf indefinitely large but distinct from one another his best known work is Contributions to the Founding of the Theory of Transfinite Numbers, 1915. Poincaré Jules-Henri Poincaré, 1854-1912 A French mathematician, theoretical astronomer, philosopher of science and physicist made a number of con contributions to the field of celestial mechanics and the theory of orbits. He had influence in the fields of cosmology and relativity. Poincaré used his impressive literary skills to make science and mathematics understandable to the public at large. His works include the New Methods of Celestial Mechanics, three volumes, 1892, 1893, and 1899. Science and Hypothesis, 1903. The Value of Science, 1905. And Science and Method, 1908. Bertrand Russell, Cantor, Poincaré, Einstein, and others have been hard at work to replace the Victorian empiricism by an intelligible, coherent interpretation of the universe by means of mathematical ideas and symbols. Modern conceptions of mathematics, chemistry and physics are sheer paradox to the plain man who thinks of matter, for example, as something that he can knock up against. There appears to be no doubt nowadays that the ultimate nature of science in any of its branches will be purely abstract, almost of a Kabbalistic character one might say. Even though it may never be officially denominated the Kabbalah, it is natural and proper to res represent the cosmos or any part of it or its operations in any of its aspects by the symbols of pure number. The ten numbers and the twenty-two letters of the Hebrew alphabet, collectively known as the thirty-two paths of wisdom. The ten numbers and the twenty-two letters of the Hebrew alphabet, with their traditional and rational correspondences, also taking into consideration their numerical and geometrical relations, afford us a coherent systematic groundwork for our alphabet, a basis sufficiently rigid for our foundation, yet sufficiently elastic for our superstructure.
Chapter 3 The Sephiroth 